Now, I don't think there's an objective position where you could say, this is when luxury products start versus when they don't start. But I would say where most people kind of classify, where I see a lot of collectors kind of putting their budget for that first luxury watch, one of the common price points is $5,000. So with this being the case, what I wanted to do was kind of reverse engineer this idea, looking at $5,000 and try to pinpoint the definitive watches of every different style or type of watch on the market that you can get for that budget amount. So in this video, we're gonna look at select different categories of what you can get for a watch for $5,000, looking at things like a dive watch, a chronograph, dress watch, things of that sort. Now, all of these prices are going to be retail to kind of future-proof this video as pre-owned, just prices change as time goes on, but we're also going to keep the price range a little bit loose. So if things are slightly below or above, we're just gonna to try to keep it in the range of $5,000 as close as we can. Also, it's going to be okay to mention a brand multiple times on this list. If it is the definitive choice for two categories or more, who cares? I think you should go for the best watch and that's really the nature of this video. And then finally, we're looking at one definitive watch per category unless it's very difficult to pick between the two. And I'm also going to try to mention an honorable mention wherever it's necessary. And before we jump into this video, definitely check out the new pre-owned section on teddybaldesser.com. If you're looking to get a great deal on a pre-owned watch or sell a watch that you're trying to move along from, definitely check it out. We'll have all the details on that page and you can go ahead and shop around as well as perhaps move on from your watch that you have in your collection. Check it out now, teddybaldesser.com. So now for our first category, we have $5,000 as a budget for a dive watch. And to me, there was one watch that came to mind immediately, and I think many people would agree with this choice, and that is with the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter Professional. So this watch, despite maybe having some polarizing attributes with the helium escape valve, and maybe having a more 1990s design in terms of the bracelet, it's still, for the money, is one of the best propositions for a dive watch, regardless of price. This formula, or at least silhouette of a case, has kind of been the same since 1993 when it was released, and of course became very popular popular after the connection to Pierce Brosnan in GoldenEye in 1995. This watch, in terms of a finishing standpoint, the wave dial, the ceramic bezel, the 8800 coaxial movement on the inside, it's just going to deliver in terms of the price. Now, some people are going to find that this wear is a little bit too large. I think it still is going to wear smaller than what the case size is going to indicate. In terms of value, you could put this up against a Rolex of Mariner and you're talking about thousands of dollars less. It's going to deliver on the finish for the price. I think almost to a higher degree than what Rolex is delivering, especially when you factor in pre-owned prices. I think if you just had to dumb things down very simply, this is one of those great watches that you could go for for that first luxury watch, could cover you in pretty much every scenario, and you're going to get an iconic design, iconic brand in Omega, and getting a well-finished product at that. As an honorable mention here, just very quickly, I will mention the Tudor Pelagos, one of my favorite dive watches. It's going to appeal a little bit to a different side of the aisle and being a bit more tool oriented in its approach. You also recently saw the release of the Pelagos Fixed, which is going to have that connection to uh, the Marine Nationale, the French Navy. Definitely would recommend checking out my full video on that one. But I think regardless of what Pelagos you go for, it's a great choice for around, just actually south of $5,000. Now for our dress watch, this one's a bit difficult because there's many that you could go for, but I was trying to figure out where's the best value residing. And it's going to allow us to maybe stretch our price a bit more. Depending on what version you go for, you can get these in the mid $5,000 range at the top end, $6,000, depending on the version you go for. But I wanna look at the JLC Reverso Classic Monoface. So this is, I would say, the classic JLC design from a contemporary perspective. It's not gonna lean so much into the 1931 original. Those you're probably going to look at the Tribute Small Seconds models, but for this video, that's gonna be priced too high. Those are around seven, $8,000. This is gonna be more appropriate for this video. I also will keep in mind as another honorable point, there are quartz models available uh, that are going to be less than five $5,000, which I thought made this an okay inclusion in this list. But if you have the budget, you know, you're around $5,000, give or take, I think you gotta go for the mechanical options instead. Now, the reason for this is just JLC as a manufacturer being so well known for their ultra thin movements and being a provider for some of the leaders in high horology providing movements to Patek Philippe, Vacheron, AP over the years, and many other brands. And of course, you could look at something like the Cartier Tank Solo, but 
For myself, I think the perfect representation of the Cartier tank is going to be with the Cartier tank Louis, which is going to be around $10,000, $11,000. The Reverso to me is a bit more visually interesting and you have a conversation starter with that chassis and case design. It's just truly iconic. And if people always ask me, you know, which one would you choose? Tank versus Reverso. I've gone back and forth quite a bit, but I think my choice would be with the Reverso. You're getting an iconic approach to its design, maybe not on the same level as the Tank. It's a great conversation starter. And unlike Cartier, that kind of is sometimes seen as more of a fashion brand, a jewelry, a jewelry brand, JLC is a true watchmaker. And I think for myself, who is really into fine watchmaking, this is more in alignment with what I care about from a watch. As an honorable mention, but also as perhaps another inclusion, I think you could probably just say there's two here for around $5,000. And that is with Grand Seiko with the SBGW231. So this is the classic manual wound dress watch from Grand Seiko and is one of the more attainable price ranges in which you can get into the brand. The conventional cream dial version can be had for $4,300, which I think is a nice price tag, where it's pretty true to its case size at 37 millimeters. So nice mix between classic case styles from the mid 20th century with modern approaches. I think that's a nice way of splitting the difference. And recently they did unveil three different green color variants within the same reference collection. So if you want something that has a bit more flair to it, those would be the ones to look at. Now for our next category, we have the everyday watch. This is not a universal term. It's just a watch uh, phrase that I use when looking at a timepiece that can handle pretty much every single scenario that you throw at it if you had to just have one in your collection. Now this is, I think, increasingly a great category because when you're talking about that first luxury watch, you want an ability and an excuse to wear it pretty much all day, every day, in every environment. And if I had to pinpoint the best representation of, in 2022 at least, what is the perfect everyday watch? I think I would go for the Omega Aquaterra. Now the Aquaterra has benefited greatly from Rolex just kind of having all these games with their just models and not being able to get them at retail where, where the Oyster Perpetual, I think as our honorable mention here, and the only reason why I'm having it as an honorable mention is because at $5,000, although it's going to retail around that price, it's just simply not available often at that price. So in that case, I think the Aquaterra, which even without the price dynamics of Rolex is still right there. And you could probably argue is a toss up between these two models. Now this model family debuted in 2002, and I almost see it as the now modern contemporary approach in living out the uh, history of the Railmaster in a modern context. I think a lot of the same principles and how this watch is positioned within the catalog is very similar to what the original 57 Railmaster was trying to embody. It has everyday versatility, can be worn in a dressy situation, but also is very sporty with its 150 meters of water resistance. You have a coaxial movement the 8900 on the inside. If you go for the pre-owned options, there is a wide variety of movements that are going to be powering those. You can get some great deals on some pre-owned Aquaterras that have those 2500 uh, movements. So those were kind of like those original coaxial calibers uh, when Omega kind of adopted the uh, Dr. George Daniels creation. Nice power reserve on these and finishing for the movement is machine finish, but still looks the part and is right in the wheelhouse for some of the best in the price range, all things considered. There's many different dial options and case sizes to choose from, which I think really allows the Aquaterra to be one of the best propositions for a luxury watch from the everyday perspective without question. As another alternative here outside of the Rolex uh, Oyster Perpetual, I'll also mention the Seamaster Railmaster. Confusing name, this Railmaster is seated within the Seamaster collection. It's a favorite of mine, but I know many people aren't as crazy about it. It's positioned right around that $5,000 range. And I think it is good value, especially pre-owned. But as somebody who likes the Railmaster DNA, I'm a fan of this design. Probably not gonna be as mass appealing as the Aquaterra, but certainly one to include as an honorable mention. So now for our next category, we have chronographs. And chronographs, I believe many enthusiasts undervalue, or at least maybe don't consider the complicated nature of making a chronograph movement in-house. When trying to get into manufactured caliber chronograph movements, $5,000 are really when the doors start to open up. And I think the best representation of value in this range, or at least starting, is going to be with the Tudor Black Bay Chrono. This watch is going to be around $5,000, give or take, depending on if you buy it pre-owned or new, but still is good value considering the movement on the inside. So this is badged as the MT5813, but in other words, this is using the Breitling B01 architecture for this movement. It's going to get an up silicon balance spring. And just to look at the context of this movement, this is available in many of the Navitimers as well as the Premier models from Breitling, which retail around 
around $8,000 for this movement. We're getting this at around $5,000. So the value is absolutely here. You're getting 200 meters of water resistance. Tudor also did a fantastic job in bringing down the case thickness of these things. So these originally were around 15 millimeters thick. They're now around 14.2 to three millimeters thick, depending on how you measure those cases, but much thinner, you certainly can notice it. What they did was they raised the dial in the case itself to allow the movement to have more space to occupy. These certainly have a bit more of a Daytona form in the design approach, but still for $5,000, they are tough to beat. What I want to also do for this category though, is have some honorable mentions on things just below and above. For the above, I would recommend looking at the Omega Speedmaster Professional uh, in the Hezolite. So that's around $6,300. I think that's good value. And if you can stretch a bit more, I think that is the definitive chronograph that you can get in the price range without question. A little bit higher, you can start getting into those Brightlings as mentioned, as well as Zenith with their El Primeros, but that's talking thousands of dollars more. So I think this is the better honorable mention to have because it's not so much of a stretch uh, compared to the Tudor. But then I also wanna mention below, I think the best representation of value from chronographs under $5,000 are from Longines. They use Eta calibers that are actually proprietary to Longines, which I think is great. And I'll also just pinpoint the master calendar chrono. To get a chronograph and a calendar on a watch, this is probably one of the most complicated watches that you're going to find for the money. This is coming for less than $4,000. This is just incredible. If you look at what is being provided from uh, Patek Philippe to get the same just layout in terms of a complication, you're talking about around $200,000. So I would certainly recommend looking at Longines. You can also look at their Avigation Big Eye, which is going to have a column wheel chronograph movement on the inside, which from a Swiss watchmaking perspective is the entry door into getting into that type of system. Most movements in this range are going to be using Valjus and are going to be having cam system rather than a column wheel. So incredible value from Longines just below. Now for our next category, we have GMTs. And I want to look at true GMTs. So in other words, isolated local time function of that hour hand. And I would say the two most approachable models from two different brands, completely different executions. One will be from Grand Seiko with their many models that are going to feature their GMT complication. But this one here, I'm gonna look at the Toge. So the SBGM 241. So this watch is only available at Watches of Switzerland, but I just love the dial as well as the approach in this design. I think it's very tasteful. The green looks fantastic underneath the macro lens. Very wearable case. You're looking at a 39 and a half millimeter case size with a lug to lug under 47 millimeters. So it's gonna wear, if not a little bit smaller than that proposed case size. You can also look at the SBGM221, which I would say is the most mass appealing GMT watch from the brand, featuring the 9S66 movement on the inside. And I know a lot of people, when they think of Grand Seiko, what do they do best? They think of perhaps the Snowflake, maybe the Four Seasons collection, but their GMTs are very well positioned in terms of value because there's not around $5,000 to get a true GMT. There's not as many options as you might think. But the other option that I would recommend would be looking at the Tudor Black Bay GMT. Now this is going to be of a more conventional, probably approach that most people will just maybe think about when they uh, imagine a GMT in their mind with the Pepsi execution of the bezel it has, you know, of course, GMT Master II uh, in mind when looking at this style. And I think it's well executed. And the Tudor Black Bay formula just simply works with this execution. One thing I will mention with these, there were some issues with the movements. I've never had any problems uh, in my time actually handling these watches and wearing these watches. So that said, I think that these are from a design perspective and getting into a GMT, a true GMT for the price. These are simply kind of that gatekeeper in the range of getting into a watch of that type. Now for our last category, we have pilot field style watches. And I think of one brand when trying to look at $5,000, what is the best representation of a watch of this style? And I have to look at IWC with the Mark 18. Now say what you want about the Mark 18 and just IWC in general. Some people kind of put down the brand because they use Solita based calibers on the inside. But I think if you're looking at a watch of this style, this is simply the best in the price range. They simply have a heritage on their side, looking back to the British military with those Mark 11s. This is that modern interpretation of that pilot style watch. It does have a 60 meters water resistant rating, which is going to be a little bit of an issue for some perhaps, but the design, the finish, the bracelet, I think, is very good and underrated. Pre-owned, these become incredible buys as well. You could typically get these for well under $5,000 pre-owned. And I think for that price, uh, it's almost a no-brainer. Some might call these watches a little bit boring, but if you're going for that just 
intended use case of a pilot or field style watch, this is simply just going to make a lot of sense. I will put an honorable mention for the Rolex Explorer, but for the same reasons as mentioned with the Oyster Perpetual, I think it has to apply here as well. It's going to be slightly more. And then when you factor in pre-owned prices and what's going on with supply, uh, or at least availability, I should say, it's going to be a tough watch to get your hands on. So for that reason, I think the IWC Mark 18 is a great choice. But all right, guys, that is my video looking at the definitive watches of different categories for $5,000. If you guys enjoyed this video and you wanna see more of these in the future at different price ranges, be happy to do it, but please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. The thumbs up will be a great indicator that you guys want more videos like this. I think this could be a really cool format going forward and really allowing people to try to maximize their budget to the fullest capacity. Also be sure to check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and offer a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer in a new pre-owned section as well. So definitely go check that out. If you wanna stay up to date with the content, be sure to follow on Instagram. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well and I will see you all very soon.